very much for that uh, lovely introduction. Uh, my name is Tori Tasker. Um, I work for the Australian Space Agency and the Australian Space Discovery Centre. Um, before I jump in, I do just want to say that there is a photo of um, the skeletal remains of a deceased person in this presentation. Um, but to start off, um, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians um, and first astronomers um, of the land upon which the Australian Space Agency headquarters and the Australian Space Discovery Centre is is located the Ghana people and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Before I jump into what I've been up to um, in my career, I want us to all have a look at this image. Um, as you can probably tell, we are currently on the moon uh, looking back at Earth. And this is a vision that we have for in about 30 years time, what we could possibly achieve on the moon. And I want you all to have a think about what jobs do you see in this photo? You, we have astronauts, absolutely. Um, but to create everything we see on the lunar surface in this picture, we need engineers, electrical engineers, mechanical engineers, software engineers. We've got some construction, so we need some construction workers and construction management. Uh, we've got a satellite dish there, so we need communications, we need IT, we need material science, medicine and health sciences, particularly if we have astronauts on the surface of the moon. We need robots, we've got some automation happening there, so we need roboticists and other engineers. We need operations and coordination to figure out how we can get something like this on the moon. And there's one job that you might not be able to pick out directly, it's that someone had to take this photo or draw this artist's impression. So you might need a photographer or an artist. So this is just a, a snapshot into the many, many things um, and many, many jobs that we need just to create what we can see in front of us right now. Now, this is there's a lot of jobs, there's a lot of goals in this photo, um, and the Australian Space Agency can't kind of do all of them at once, um, but we're here to figure out what's the best thing we can contribute. And at the moment, that's looking in our Moon to Mars space program. A few years ago, NASA announced that they want to send astronauts back to the moon and eventually onto Mars in the NASA Artemis program. And Australia really stepped up in wanting to support this mission. And we do this through a $150 million investment uh, into the NASA Artemis program through our supply chain program, a demonstrator program, and a trailblazer program. And all of these programs are really a way of figuring out how we can get Australian products, Australian companies, and Australian people into this kind of global and, I guess, galactic um, mission to help us get into space. So that's really what the Australian Space Agency is here to do. We're here to support um, everyone in Australia who might want to put something in space or work towards technologies that can help the space sector. We're here to transform and grow a globally respected space sector that lifts the broader economy, inspires and improves all of our lives. We really are connected to space more than you might think if you used the GPS or checked the, the weather this morning. Uh, you've been connecting with space. Um, and what we really want to do is underpin that by really connecting with everyone across the country, but also connect across the world. A great thing about space is that we, we can go and do it all together across the nation. Now, I didn't start my career by looking up at the stars. I started my career by actually looking underground. Um, I started at uni with a Bachelor of Psychology and Science, decided this absolutely was not for me, um, and began a Bachelor of Archaeology. I specialised in forensic anthropology and paleopathology, which basically meant I spent about three and a half years looking at bones and figuring out how this person may have died, um, what can you tell about their culture or their history, where they grew up, how old they were, did they have any injuries, did they have any diseases? Um, so it was a really, um, a really fun way of beginning um, my career and quite a different way to where I end, ended up, and that's what I really want to share today, is that I started somewhere and ended up somewhere else completely different. Um, and that's a really exciting thing about the space sector, is that you can really shoehorn anything into some kind of space job, which is really exciting. So after I finished my Bachelor of um, Archaeology, I wondered what I could do with that um, and decided to do, to do some more study and look at our museum studies. So thinking about how do we actually talk about our past, talk about histories um, in a public setting. This then kind of led me on to understanding how we talk about science and how we talk about science stories and narratives throughout history and going on to the future as well. So when thinking about what my journey has been, um, it's been a bit, a bit of everything. And what I've always wanted to try and do is find out how can I have a job or a career that allows me to intersect all these different things that I love to, to think about and to do. 
Um, I love thinking about archaeology and museums and, and history and how that influences our future. I love thinking about space. It's it's a really it's really exciting to think about what's up there. It's an incredibly unknown. I love science communication. I love talking um, and sharing those stories and sharing um, people as they as they go on their journey to find out um, things in science. And I love experiencing new things. I, I love traveling and meeting new people and doing things that might be a little bit terrifying. So I wanted to find something that may kind of intersect all of those things. Um, and not all of those things happened at one time. Um, I started I, my natural progression from doing archaeology is to look at space history and space artifacts. Uh, in this photo, I'm looking at some really old uh, photographs of the moon. Um, I was in Melbourne working with um, the Melbourne Planetarium team and Museums Victoria are currently restoring the Great Melbourne Telescope. So there's some really, you can see that book is, is huge, much, much bigger than how we'd probably store photos these days. Um, but really incredible to see how history can relate to space as well. But wanting to step forward a little bit more, sometimes it's looking at space artifacts. Sometimes it's talking to thousands of people in one day at a science festival. Uh, this is me and my team at the New Scientist Life Festival uh, in London a couple of years ago. And that was all about sharing stories about Apollo. Um, Apollo 11, 50th anniversary was a couple of years ago. And it's it's such a different experience working on the operational side of something. So I was working on this exhibition for about nine months. And what that really showed me is that it's not just the, I guess, the content of things you learn at university that will help you figure out where your journey is. I'm a, I'm a, a big planner and a big organiser. I love scheduling. Um, and that's what I really brought into helping build this exhibition was not just the space knowledge that I had and the knowledge I knew about how to communicate science, but it's all the other skills that just make me who I am that are that are important to how I do my job. Um, so that's something I absolutely stress is that it, there's a lot of life and soft skills that are just as important to figuring out where you want to go and what career you wanted to take on um, throughout kind of your your journey. Um, and one of those things is figuring out what you thought you you could never do, but eventually um, just kind of jump into. I never thought that doing media or radio or TV was anything I could ever do. I was just like, no, nope, that's not not something that was for me. Um, talking live on national radio was something that I, I was not thinking I was capable of. Um, but I think being brave, being bold and being willing to, to fail and make mistakes often will lead you to opportunities you might never have thought about. So this is me with my, uh, my friend Svetlana. She um, is a mannequin that's wearing a Soviet era, so roughly like 1960s uh, pressure suit. Uh, we use her to talk about how astronauts wear launch, uh, wear launch and re-entry suits so that if something happens with their capsule, they'll be safe before they get back down to Earth and not have kind of a, a lack of pressure um, affect them too much. Um, but I'd absolutely say, you know, sharing stories, sharing passion, sharing innovation is just as a crucial part of the space sector as it is putting something in space. Space is exciting, the technology and the innovation is incredible, but it has so much more meaning when those stories are able to be shared. So media and journalism, I think, are just such an incredible and important part of the space sector. Uh, and that leads me on to something, something else in the space sector that is really really cool and that is meeting incredible people um i've been very fortunate to meet some really inspiring people in the space sector and across other sectors as well and that's such a important part i think is putting yourself out there to meet me and be exposed to as many stories and journeys as possible there's no one direct career path the um the man in the middle of this photo is astronaut tim peak it's a british uh, european space agency astronaut that went up a few years ago um, but I just don't just want to point out the astronauts because while being an astronaut would be absolutely incredible and I would 100% take up the opportunity uh, if I could. Um, it's also the people that you work with every day. So the other two women next to me are space physics teachers and work for the National Space Academy in Australia and deliver space engineering courses across the country um, all year round. And I think finding those people that inspire you to be curious and be passionate and to challenge you to do things that you never thought you could do are just as important as meeting the really cool people like um, astronauts. And of course, being in science communication and in space, a big part of my job is dressing up. Um, I love, you know, donning a blue suit and uh, pretending to be an astronaut for a day or two um, or chucking on a massive um, 
space walk suit. Um, it's it's important to have fun, um, and I think I've definitely been fortunate enough uh, to be able to find that um, in a career in space. There's lots of, lots of exciting things happening, and uh, that sometimes includes hanging upside down. Um, this was taken at the UK Space Conference a couple of years ago, and it's again, it's just an example of taking opportunities, talking to different people, um, putting yourselves in situations that maybe you aren't 100% comfortable in, but usually those are the ones uh, where I've learned the most. And speaking of learning the most, I uh, love taking on things that I never thought I could do. Um, so currently I'm learning to fly a plane. Uh, hopefully one day someone will let me pilot a spacecraft, but for now I'm going to stick with the plane. I'm currently working towards my private pilot's license. So it's really to me, you know, all aspects of my life that pull together where I want to go. You know, your career is is really exciting, and but to me, it's one part of combining the life skills that you get, uh, the people that you surround you, yourself with, and the fun hobbies you get uh, to have in the meantime. So I hope that that has given you a little bit of insight into that there might just be more than an astronaut in space. We need engineers, we need rocket scientists, we need science communicators, we need lawyers, physicists, game developers, work health and safety officers, risk team. We need designers, we need artists, chemists, biologists. We, we need a lot of business people, particularly with the incredible startup nature of space. And what I wanted to end with is a little bit about what I do now. So currently I work for the Australian Space Agency in the Australian Space Discovery Centre. Um, and this is just a bit of a photo from where we are located here in Adelaide. And uh, this is a photo of the Responsive Space Operations Centre. Uh, so it's our real life mission control. We have uh, downstairs under my feet right now, um, hosted by a company called Sabre Astronautics. And they're there to actually track and monitor satellites in space. So it's all about connecting the, the general public and schools and students with industry and helping them inspire, you know, inspire everyone uh, to see really where space could go. Um, and I think that's uh, it for me. Thank you very much for listening, everyone. Um, and are there any questions? Uh, yeah, thank you. Before um, to the Q before we do the Q and A section, we'll just show a little video for Australian Space Discovery Centre. Thank you. What do you dream of doing with your future? Do you want to help people with a career in health? What do you dream of doing with your future? Do you want to help people with a career in healthcare? to master a trade and build things with your hands, to be the next startup that invents a new piece of life-changing technology, or to make a difference for our planet or people in need. Whatever your career ambitions, you can make them happen in space. When most people think about jobs in space, they think of astronauts, rocket scientists, and software engineers sitting in rooms with lots of computers. And in reality, thousands of different jobs on Earth come together to make every space achievement possible. There are the space researchers and scientists who investigate and test how we can do things safer, quicker or further. The engineers who design spacecraft like satellites, from the mechanics through to the astronautics. Software developers who build and code the critical parts of space systems. And mathematicians and analysts keeping everything running smoothly. There are also the aspiring entrepreneurs and startups, leveraging space technologies like the Internet of Things to solve challenges. The lawyers helping to regulate a constantly changing industry, and even the PR professionals, helping to share how space improves people's lives. Here in Australia, the space industry is growing quickly. In fact, it's expected that by 2030, there'll be 30,000 people working in space. By thinking about a career in space now, you can make the most of your future tomorrow. And the Australian Space Discovery Centre is where you can learn about exciting job roles, 
accessible study pathways, and the worlds of opportunity that await. See your future in space. Thank you for that video. Now we'll head to the Q&A. Um, the first question for you, Tori, is what year do you think we'll make it to space? <laughs> to space as humans? Yeah. Hopefully, uh, I would say, you know, our aim, I think the NASA, the NASA aim is 2024, which is not too long away. It's been, you know, over 50 years since uh, we've been had a human presence on the moon. Uh, so hopefully the next five to 10 years, we'll see um, the next presence. And of course, the first woman on the moon as well would be really, really exciting. And I think as we go forward, hopefully we'll just see, you know, more and more people have access to space, which would be really exciting. So hopefully, in, definitely in our lifetime, uh, but hopefully sooner rather than later. Yeah. If you had the opportunity to live on a different planet, would you? Oh, great question. 100%. I would absolutely love to go and uh, try and live on another planet. Uh, but with the, the promise that the technology is where it, where it needs to be to help you survive um, on whichever planet I choose to go and live on. Yeah. Um, after Mars, what planet do you think we'll go to next? Ooh, that's a very, very great question. Um, it would probably have to be um, one of our uh, rocky planets. So you've got Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. Um, it might be a bit harder to go to one of our gas giants. Um, a lot of those don't have uh, a lot of a lot of solid surface um, and a lot of gas in atmosphere to be able to get through. So potentially uh, one of the other rocky planets, maybe that would be really exciting. But I think there's a lot of challenge even just getting to Mars and to the moon. Um, so I think there's a great focus on those two um, just there. Yeah. How do you go about getting a plane's license? Is it expensive? <laughs> uh, I do have to say it is an expensive hobby, um, but it's absolutely uh, a fun one. Um, if you just head on to, to the internet, um, there's the um, Civil Aviation Authority for Australia called CASA, C-A-S-A, -A, um, and that should be able to direct you to where you can uh, have a look and learn, learn to fly away. There's three different pilots licenses. There's a recreational, private and commercial, um, all of which allow you to do different things um, when flying a type of plane. Yep. Um, how do you go about getting, oh sorry, how do you think you'll ever get into space? How do I think I'll get into space? Oh, it's a great question. Uh, I am looking to do a bit of engineering study in the next couple of years, so maybe that will be my, my route in. Um, but we also need operations and logistics coordinators um, as we move further into space. There's a lot, a lot of transport, a lot of um, cargo and survival equipment needed if we're going to put humans out into space. So maybe that way. Uh, I've tried, tried my bet at a few different things. Um, fingers crossed that one day maybe <laughs> I'll get into space. That would be great. Um, what is the highlight of your career so far? Ooh, I, I feel very fortunate that that's a very difficult question. Um, I think I uh, started my career only about five years ago wanting to do space and, and talk about space as a science communication job. Um, but back when I was looking for a job, the Australian Space Discovery Centre didn't really exist. Um, and a lot of, um, there weren't many, I guess, space specific science communication jobs. So I moved overseas. Um, to the UK for a couple of years. Um, but I think, you know, the highlight is, is coming back and actually be able to help build the Australian Space Discovery Centre and be a part of the Australian Space Agency. You know, it's still a relatively small team for the amount of work that we do. Um, so being part of that legacy is probably probably something I'll always look back on as, as the highlight. Yep. Who do you think is the leading company in space? Um, <laughs> like such as SpaceX or NASA? Great question. Um, I don't think there's a particular leading because I think it's such a collaborative effort. Um, I think NASA, and you know, if we're talking about NASA and SpaceX, um, you know, one's a, a private commercial company and one's a government organisation. So they do both have different, different rebits, but I think it's all about working together. And I think that's what SpaceX and NASA do now is really actually being able to help each other uh, rather than be a competition to, to get into space. Um, 
What is the model on the desk behind you? <laughs> this one just here? Yeah. That is the Apollo 11 Loon Lander. It is a Lego set, which I also have at home. <laughs> yeah. Do you think humans will ever colonize um, the moon or is it not possible and should and should we look at Mars instead? Uh, it's a great question and it also depends on, I guess, you know, what what we mean by the word colonize is that is that a permanent base, is that a temporary base? Um, I think, you know, we start with the aim of, of getting humans back. Um, there's also a lot of discussion about what else we put on the moon. How can we create, I guess, a more sustainable um, and I guess more friendly approach to being in space? Um, launching things into space is, is expensive and, and it's hard. Space is a hard thing to be a part of um, in terms of actually getting things into space. Um, so I think there's a few initial challenges before we look at saying we're going to turn, set up a, a permanent base. Uh, the moon is much, much closer than Mars um, and has, uh, in terms of communications and IT and things like that, much easier to, to connect with. So I think we start with the moon uh, and then we'll see what happens after that onto Mars maybe. Yeah. Uh, what do you do on a daily basis at the Australian Space Agency? Good question. Uh, so I'm currently upstairs on the, uh, the level of the headquarters of the agency, but most of my time is actually spent down in the Australian Space Discovery Centre. So we are open to the public Wednesday through to Sunday. Uh, we also work from school groups um, in those days as well. And we have a space gallery, which is an interactive space built by Questacon in Canberra. Um, so lots of hands on activities, hands on desks, um, all interacting with different things about um, space and Australia's capability in space. Uh, so I might spend some time in there. Um, we also have a team of space communicators who are around the gallery, around the Discovery Centre to chat to people as they come through. So I work with them a lot, help manage their time and uh, what they do. Um, other times it's just making sure I know what's happening in space because it's our job to, to, to talk to people about it. So I, I try and keep myself across as much, as much knowledge as possible. Um, what about the leading country? We often hear a lot about the US companies, but do you know any other countries that are actively looking to travel further in space? It's a great question because I think it's it's really become such a global effort. You've got many, many space, many, many companies that are starting up their own space agencies. I mean, we just look across across the ocean a little bit. We have New Zealand and they have a space agency and they're launching rockets from, from New Zealand into space. So it's really, um, I guess, anyone's game to be able to get into space, but it, it is also a really collaborative effort. Um, not everyone can be great at everything all the time, and it's figuring out what are those, what are the benefits and what are the opportunities that different countries can bring in. So while the US has been a, a player in, in this in space for a really, really long time, there are definitely other countries um, that are wanting to, to contribute just as much. You look at Europe, you have the European Space Agency, so that's a whole bunch of nations working together to get things into space. You've also got, you know, Russia, China, Taiwan, you've got lots of different countries that are wanting to contribute to the, the global space sector, which is really exciting. Um, it's it's not, you know, well, it, it may be, some people may see this a competition, it's actually how can we all contribute together to advance overall humanity's, um, I guess, spacefaring um, ability. Yeah. Uh, what is the best and the worst career decision you have ever made? Oh, that is a tough question. Best and worst career decisions I've ever made. I like to think they've all been good, I hope, but no, I'm sure there are some some interesting ones. Um, you know what, I'd, I'd probably say I actually wanted to do medicine when I was in high school. I was absolutely set on going and doing medicine. Um, and I don't, I don't test well, I don't exam well, so this wasn't something that um, I was actually able to do, I, I sat several tests and everything to try and get in and wasn't able to, but that's probably worked out absolutely for the best. So I think um, being being brave and doing what you love, I think I started my uni time um, doing a Bachelor of Science, even though I perhaps didn't really love it. I think I was looking at what's the career on the other side. Um, but I think changing that degree to an archaeology degree was the, the best decision I think I've made. Um, just following what I loved, um, what I enjoyed the most. Yeah, um, I think we have time for one final question. Um, what are your thoughts on other life on nearby planets such as Mars? <laughs> I mean, never say never. 
um, it's this incredible amounts of research, particularly going into Mars, um, to look at was there life on Mars? Is there life on Mars? Um, you've got the end of the NASA Perseverance rover soon in a few years. We'll have the European Space Agency's ExoMars rover, which is going to drill about a meter and a half underneath the surface to really see what maybe it's below the surface of Mars that will find life um, or signs of past life. So I, I hope that what we do, I mean, I hope that we do in our lifetime, I think it'll be absolutely game changing. Um, but there's also, you know, promise of uh, I guess the uh, environment of life that we're looking for on other moons of other planets, such as Europa as well, or, you know, maybe one day we'll have the technology to go further out into exoplanets outside of our solar system. Uh, but for now, I think sticking to Mars is a, is a great option um, with the amounts of technology and all the, I guess, the rovers and the robots we have on Mars now. Yeah. Thanks, Tori, for your insights and sharing your experience about IT careers. Nice. Thank you for having me.